It's my uh, great honor to introduce one of the good guys. You know, Washington, D.C. has a few good guys and some that are not so good. Uh, I think some of you were here when I introduced uh, the speakers for the Gerson event. And I said at that time, I only knew one speechwriter in my life. I was half right. I actually know two. Pete Weiner uh, was a speechwriter, not only for one president, but for three. Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. Um, and he's gifted. He still writes. He's a writer. I'd like to think of him as the pundit with a conscience. If JFK were still alive today and he did a, a book on, on people with conscience who are on the media, he'd write a profile in Courage about Pete Weiner. Uh, Mr. Weiner calls it straight when it comes to what we should be looking for in our political candidates. Character does still matter. And Pete writes about that with convincing logic. He uh, is also a contributing editor for The Atlantic. He uh, is now a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum. Uh, he was a graduate of UW. Those of you who are living out west know that UW is University of Washington. I think those are the Huskies, right? So he was a Husky. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Pete Weiner to Wheaton College. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming uh, out this, uh, this evening. It's a pleasure uh, to, to be with you. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude uh, to Wheaton College for inviting me to speak uh, this evening, and especially uh, to thank David, uh, my host and the director of the Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics, where he provides superb leadership, and to Catherine uh, Bes Baskmott, I hope I get that right. Uh, she's been super helpful in organizing things and, and very kind. Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, my friend Floyd Kwame and his family. Floyd has done um, so much uh, to support Wheaton College and generation of, of students um, here. It's always a pleasure uh, for me to be on a campus of a great university. The British uh, poet John Maysfield said a century ago, there are few earthly things more beautiful than a university. It's a place where those who hate ignorance may strive to know, and those who perceive truth may strive to make others see. And uh, Wheaton College is an institution of faith committed to truth and to rigorous intellectual inquiry with a wonderful and admirable history and a home uh, to suburb scholars, one of whom, uh, John Dixon, I, I had the pleasure of having lunch with um, earlier today. I also want to mention two personal connections that I have uh, to Wheaton. The first is that my wonderful niece, Stephanie Olson, graduated from Wheaton, class of 2007. And I recall traveling uh, here for her graduation and what a joy that was. And second, Wheaton is the alma mater uh, of my closest friend of the last quarter century, Michael Gerson. Uh, I loved Mike, who passed away at the end of last year. And I have a special place uh, in my heart for Wheaton because of the enormous role that it played in Mike's life in shaping him into the man of integrity uh, that uh, he was. I chose uh, as my topic today the ways in which Christianity can be a healing force in American society, uh, in part because of its timeliness. Our divisions today are deep and daunting, and I thought it might be helpful to begin this address by assessing the polarized state uh, of our nation. America is a riven society. Uh, let me focus for a moment on a subject that I know something about, um, politics. Political divisions have always existed in America, uh, but they've been on the rise for years. The gap between the Republican and Democratic parties has only grown more sharply in Congress, while the share of Americans who interact with people from the other party has plummeted. Studies tell us the Democrats and Republicans both say that the other party's members are hypocritical, selfish, and closed-minded, and they are unwilling to socialize across party lines. Many Americans only read news or get information from sources that align with their political beliefs, which exacerbates fundamental disagreements about not just policies, but about basic facts. So-called effective polarization, a phenomenon in which citizens feel more negatively toward other political parties than they feel positively uh, toward their own, has increased more dramatically in America than in any of the other democracies. 
Indeed, no established democracy in recent history has been as deeply polarized as the US. Knowledgeable observers have said the nation is confronting the greatest strain to its fundamental cohesion since the Civil War. Uh, political and data analysts tell us that hatred, specifically hatred of the other party, increasingly defines our politics. Bear in mind, too, that it was only three years ago that we experienced one of the most difficult and divisive years in our history. In 2020, we faced a once in a century pandemic, racial unrest, protests in the streets, a deeply contentious election. And then came January 6th, 2021, and an unprecedented act of political uh, violence. The citadel of American democracy, the United States Capitol, was attacked by people seeking uh, to overturn the results of a free and fair election. Uh, they beat police. Uh, they wanted to hang the vice president. That was awful enough. What made it even worse is that the instigator of the effort was the president of the United States. Beyond that, public health measures taken in the midst uh, 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 became a symbol of, of a culture war uh, during the pandemic. Um, which, was, which was unprecedented uh, in 100 years. And hundreds of thousands of people, nearly a quarter of a million people, died um, as a result of, uh, of that. So there's something troubling going on, issues having to do with our soul and our spirit, a confusion of purpose, a breakdown in human relationships and human intimacy. As a friend of mine put it, there's the feeling that we're at each other's throats. There's no sense of pride in being a part of anything and no sense of belonging. With that as a backdrop, uh, I want to turn my focus on the Christian church in general and American evangelicalism in particular. That's the world I know best. It's the faith community in which I've spent most of my life, and self-described evangelicals make up about a quarter of the US population. So what happens in that subculture matters to the rest of the nation. It's important to point out that there are millions and millions of individual Christians doing remarkable work to care for those living in the shadows of society, those who suffer, those who grieve. Most people of the Christian faith I know are decent and honorable, good citizens, and I'm indebted to the people of the Christian faith who have helped shape me and who have come alongside me in times of hardship and grief. But in terms of our common life, our civic society, our political life, there's been a breakdown. And let me go a step further. Much of what is being done by evangelical Christians is damaging our civic fabric and undermining the public witness of Christianity. If I had to boil down my concerns to a single sentence, it would be this. In too many cases, evangelicals are subordinating Christian faith to political tribalism, partisan loyalties, and political power. And in doing so, they're using methods and means that are fundamentally at odds with what the American theologian Eugene Peterson called the Jesus way. Peterson argued that the American church is enamored with the truth of Jesus, but ignores the methods by which Jesus embodies that truth. Christianity is obviously not just about affirming a particular creed or set of dogmas, of which there are plenty of differences, but following the ways of Jesus, modeling one's conduct, one's sensibilities, the means we employ after those of Christ. That goes for every area of our lives, including politics and cultural engagement. According to Peterson, we can't suppress the Jesus way in order to sell the Jesus truth. The Jesus way and the Jesus truth must be congruent. An unchristian friend of mine told me that what is unfolding is consistent with what sociobiology theorizes about religion. Its evolutionary purpose is to foster in-group solidarity. Principles serve rather than rule that mission. Now that certainly isn't my view of faith, but in the current circumstances, given what's played out in public over the last few decades, and especially over the last half dozen years or so, that is not an unreasonable conclusion for him to draw. And he's not alone. This kind of perception is multiplying. A reporter I know visited Wheaton prior to the pandemic and he spent time with 14 political science students and he wrote me saying that most of them told him that they were much less willing to be identified as evangelicals, not because they had a crisis of faith exactly, but because they were so sickened by the way evangelicals had squandered their moral authority 
enacted with such transparent hypocrisy during recent years. That was their perception. And I've heard from pastors in different parts of America who describe what's happening as a generational catastrophe, in large part because young people in particular see faith as an instrument of division in our democracy instead of grace and greater understanding. My concern then is that many Christians are not offering an alternative to the worst tendencies in our society, but rather accelerating them. We need to turn that around. Followers of Jesus need to light candles instead of simply curse the darkness, and there are things that can be done writ small and writ large. Some of them are connected to politics, many are not, but together they can influence our culture and our wider society for the better. I should say here that these are things that I struggle with, goals I fall short of, that I need to be reminded of. We're all fallen, but we also need to aspire to better things. With that in mind, here are some suggestions of how faith, specifically the Christian faith, can be a healing force in American society and strengthen American democracy. First, we need to show that we take seriously Christian anthropology. What I mean by that is that we need to demonstrate to a watching world in a compelling and persuasive way that we're all made in the image of God and all includes those with whom we disagree. The Latin term imago dei has its roots in Genesis where we're told God created man and woman in his image. This scriptural passage implies that we, are hu that we humans are in the image of God in our moral, spiritual, and intellectual nature, that each of us has inestimable worth and inherent dignity. There are special qualities of human nature which allows God to be manifest in each of us. The great distinctive Christian involvement in public life should be to care for all, for those within our religious and political tribe and those without. There should be no one on the outside no one treated as alien or subhuman, including, and even especially, the poor and the weak, the dispossessed and the abused, the wounded traveler on the road to Jericho. Think about how profoundly better things would be if we showed the world that we won't pass the other side. Second, Christians need to be models uh, of listening well. We need to listen in order to learn, not just listen in order to respond, not just listen to justify ourselves. We know that to successfully communicate with people who hold views different than we do, they need to feel heard. It isn't effective to lecture people or to marshal facts in an effort to overwhelm them, and it certainly doesn't work to make others feel insulted, dishonored, or under attack. We need to show a real interest in others, which builds trust, which in turn builds bridges. But it goes deeper than that. There is such a thing as collective wisdom. We're all better off if we have within our orbit people who see the world somewhat differently than we do. As iron sharpens iron, the book of Proverbs says, so one person sharpens another. But this requires us to actually engage with and carefully listen to people who understand things in ways dissimilar to how we do. It means we have to venture out of our political and theological cul-de-sacs from time to time. It's worth the effort. We also need to see those with whom we disagree in mid-story and see ourselves in mid-story as well. None of us are completed works. We might keep in mind too what was said uh, of Pope Francis. He's an evangelist, not an activist. He believes in encounter rather than confrontation. Third, people of the Christian faith should model what it means to debate and disagree well. All of us can do better at viewing debate, less as an arena for conquest and more as an arena for learning. Let me explain what I mean. C.S. Lewis referred to his childhood friend Arthur Greaves as his first friend, and the philosopher and poet Owen Barfield as his second friend. A first friend, according to Lewis, is one's alter ego. The person who first reveals to you that you are not alone in the world by turning out to share all your most secret delights. There's nothing to be overcome in making him your friend. He and you join 
like raindrops on a window. A second friend is the person who, in the words of Lewis, disagrees with you about everything. He's not so much the alter ego as the anti-self. Of course he shares your interest, otherwise he would not become your friend at all. But he has approached them all at a different angle. He has read all the right books, but has got the wrong things out of every one. It is as if he spoke your language, but mispronounced it. How can he be so nearly right, and yet, invariably, just not right? Lewis went on to say, when you set out to correct his heresies, you find that he has decided to correct yours. And then you go at it, hammer and tongs, far into the night, night after night, each learning the weight of the other's punches, and often more like mutually respectful enemies than friends. Actually, though it never seemed so at the time, you modify one another's thoughts. Out of this perpetual dogfight, a community of mind and of deep affection emerges. What is striking is that both Lewis and Barfield treasured their friendship precisely because they helped each other see things that they would otherwise have been blind to. They felt like they helped each other widen the aperture when it comes to seeing truth. In argument, Barfield said, we always, both of us, were arguing for the truth, not for victory. If we could move closer to the Lewis Barfield model of dialogue and debate, we'd all be far better off. It would certainly help us think of our national politics as something other than a fight to the death. Fourth, Christians should model humility and epistemic modesty. Over breakfast several years ago uh, with a friend of mine, the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt, I asked him what uh, constructive contributions Christians could make to public life. An atheist who finds much to admire in religion, John answered simply, humility. This is a perfectly reasonable hope, yet humility is hardly a hallmark of American Christianity, especially, but by no means exclusively, among those Christians prominently involved in politics. There we often see arrogance, haughtiness, and pride, which is not only the original sin, but also the one most antithetical to a godly cast of mind. My own understanding of humility is inextricably tied to a decades-long journey of faith. From it, I've become convinced that Christians should be characterized by humility. This doesn't mean that followers of Jesus should be indifferent to a moral order grounded in eternal truths or unable to judge some things as right and others wrong, but they ought to be alert first and foremost to their own shortcomings, to the awareness of how wayward our own hearts are, how even good acts are often tainted by selfish motives, how we all struggle with brokenness in our lives. This is not an argument for self-loathing, it's an argument for self-awareness. At the core of Christian doctrine is the belief that we've all fallen short, that our loves are disordered, and our lives sometimes a mess, and therefore we're in need of grace. As a result, one of the defining qualities of a Christian's witness to the world should be gentleness, an ironic spirit, and empathy. The mark of genuine humility is not self-abasement as much as self-forgetting, which, which in turn allows us to take an intense interest in the lives of others. In my last uh, conversation with him before he died in 2015, Steve Hayner, who was president of Columbia Theological Seminary and an enormously influential figure in my life, put it well. I believe in objective truth, Steve told me, but I hold lightly to our ability to perceive truth. What Steve meant by this, I think, is that the world is unfathomably complex. To believe we have mastered it in all respects, that our angle of vision on matters like politics, philosophy and theology is just right all the time is ridiculous. This doesn't mean one ought to live in a state of perpetual doubt and uncertainty. If we did, we could never speak up for justice and moral truth. It does mean, however, that we're aware that what we know is at best incomplete. We see through a glass darkly, as how St. Paul put it in one of his letters to the Corinthians, we know only in part. This should be particularly clear to those who come from a faith tradition that speaks about total depravity 
and the noetic effects of sin. My point is not that humility is uniquely available to Christians. It is simply that Christian teaching and tradition, rightly understood, affirms its importance. None of us sees the truth in its totality, and all of us need the eyes and ears of others, friends, writers, those from earlier ages, to help us in the journey. Fifth, we should model attractive community. In American society today, we're witnessing record levels of depression, isolation, and loneliness among young people in particular. People feel increasingly unseen and unheard. There's an intense pessimism among the younger generation, which believes the older generation has failed them. My friend Yuval Levin, who's Jewish, has told me that Christian communities, if they're wise, will see that they have a special role in, uh, to play in meeting those needs. What faith communities can offer is not just a philosophy of life, but community unified by a deep common commitment to the truth and a vision of the good. An attractive community that provides a venue for genuine flourishing can change minds far better than an argument, according to Yuval. Ask yourself this question. How did a tiny and obscure messianic movement in the second and third centuries become the dominant faith in Western civilization? The sociologist of religion, Rodney Stark, points to early Christians' communal compassion and social networks their care for the sick widows and orphans, their welcoming of strangers and care for outsiders, their respect for women who were considered at best second-class citizens, and their connection to non-Christians. Now ask yourself a second question. Is that what Christians are known for today? A friend of mine, a pastor on the West Coast, told me how Christians responded to the AIDS crisis in the 1980s haunts me. Had we, like the first Christians, cared first and cared most for the modern day plague victims, I think we'd be in a whole different conversation with the gay community. I believe the dialogue would be one of more mutual respect, and I believe the gay community would feel less afraid of the wounds Christians can inflict. But even if the conversation weren't different, caring first and caring most for those victims of a plague would have been the right thing to do. Earlier this year, I was on a group Zoom call in which we talked about the He Gets Us campaign. If you're not familiar with it, it's a $100 million effort launched last year that blanketed cities, the web, and television aimed to redeem Jesus' brand from the damage done by some of his followers. We were talking about its effectiveness, and one person on the call, a Christian, said, no one has a problem with Jesus. It's his followers they don't like. Another person on the call, a non-believer, said they should change the name from he gets us till we betrayed him. You see the problem. Six, Christians can model to a suffering world what it means to process suffering and to live with wounds. Remember that Jesus, after his resurrection, in his glorified body, still bore the visible marks of his wounds. Too often in evangelical circles, we want to signal to the world that we have our lives all together, even when we don't that we are shiny, happy people, often when we're not. One person put it this way, church felt like an event where participants presented highly edited versions of themselves. Scott Dudley, a longtime friend of mine and pastor at Bellevue Presbyterian Church, told me that when he's counseling or mentoring others, often the most helpful thing I bring is my wounds. Wounded people make the best healers because they know what it means to be wounded, he said. I'm a better healer, not in spite of my wounds, but because of my wounds. All that to say, sometimes the most helpful things we bring is our wounds, which is another reason Jesus kept a reminder of his, Scott added. His point isn't that Jesus' wounds were flaws. It is that they were wounds that left scars and that not hiding them can be a help to us and to others. The artist Maku Fujimura has written about the Japanese tradition of kintsugi. Kintsugi is the art of repairing broken pottery pieces with liqueur dusted with gold. A kintsugi master will take the broken work and create a restored piece that makes the broken parts even more visually sophisticated. It's built on the idea that embracing flaws and imperfections 
you can create a more beautiful and a more valuable piece of art. Applying that to theology, it's through our brokenness that God's grace can shine through. As Mako has written, Kintsugi bowls are treasured as objects that surpass their original useful purpose and move into the realm of beauty brought on by the Kintsugi master. Thus, our brokenness, in light of the wounds of Christ, still visible after the resurrection, can also mean that through making, by honoring the brokenness, the broken shapes can somehow be a necessary component of the new world to come. I find the concept that fractures in our lives can be redeemed and leveraged for good deeply moving. All things, even broken things, can be made new again. And sometimes they can be made even more beautiful. And they need not be hidden in shadows or in shame. None of this means that people if they had a choice, would endure the blast furnace of pain and loss, of trauma and shattered lives. It means only that even out of ashes, beauty can emerge. Seventh, we should model grace. Here we can learn from the author Philip Yancey, who in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, wrote, grace comes free of charge to people who do not deserve it, and I'm one of those people. I think back to who I was, Resentful, wound tight with anger, a single hardened link in a long chain of ungrace, learned from a family and church. Now I'm trying in my own small way to pipe the tune of grace. I do so because I know more surely than I know anything that any pang of healing or forgiveness of goodness I have ever felt comes solely from the grace of God. I yearn for the church to become a nourishing culture of that grace. Eight summers ago, uh, many of you will recall, nine African Americans were gunned down during a Bible study at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. The gunman, Dylan Roof, was motivated uh, by racism. Less than 48 hours after the killings, the victims' families were allowed to speak directly to Roof at his first court appearance. The family members spoke in honest, unaffected way about their grief and heartache. Yet they bestowed forgiveness upon a man who had killed their loved ones. It was an extraordinary moment. These Christians vividly demonstrated how forgiveness can result in not just healing, but also political change. Within days of their courtroom statements, then South Carolina government, Governor Nikki Haley endorsed removing the Confederate flag from state grounds, and within weeks, the state legislature voted to take it down. People who would not have reversed course under the threat of boycotts and political attacks changed their minds after amazing acts of grace. Division gave way to unity because a group of wounded Christians elevated the sights and spirit of everyone around them. The greatest and most powerful Christian distinctive is not the exercise of power, it is the offer of grace. In saying all of this, I want to emphasize that in offering grace and listening well to others and in showing proper humility, we should not be indifferent to telling the truth or calling out lies and liars or fail to criticize what deserves criticism or stay silent in the face of wrongdoing. Christians are not called to be passive in the face of maliciousness. Uh, a few years ago, Mark Laberton, the recently retired president of Fuller Theological Seminary, delivered a lecture creating beauty in exile that helped me to see things in a different way than I have in the past. In the lecture, he offers a distinctive way for Christians to conceive of their calling from people who see themselves as living in a promised land and demanding it back to living a faithful, exilic life. It's a very different approach, creating different expectations and understandings of our situation, our place, our posture, our purpose. Mark speaks about what it means to live as people in exile, trying to find the capacity to love in unexpected ways, to see the enemy, the foreigner, the stranger, and the alien, and to go towards them rather than away from them. He asks what a life of faithfulness looks like while living in a world of fear. In the lecture, Mark recounts remarkable stories of people creatively, courageously, and faithfully engaging with the world, 
the woman who lost 41 relatives in the Rwandan Civil War and yet finds a way to extend grace amidst the toxicity of bitterness, resentment, and hatred. The woman in her guild who made beautiful quilts from those traumatized and suffering in hospitals in Eastern Congo, showing that there was a place for beauty even in the context of utter dislocation and violence. The church that held traditional beliefs on human sexuality tending to the AIDS garden in Golden Gate Park with humility, love, kindness, and compassion, and in the process, developing understanding, trust, and meaningful relationships. Egyptians on the Fuller campus who, in the aftermath of ISIS killings of Christians in Egypt, turned a memorial service into a celebration of those who were martyred. Mark Laberton concludes his lecture this way. The reason this enterprise of culture care is so critical is because it awakens to us as Mako Fuji more often says, no longer talking in terms of culture war, but culture care. Culture care is an expression of faithful, exilic life. How do we actually show up building houses, planting gardens, loving and seeking justice, being people who seek the shalom of our enemy fortress? For it's, it's in that shalom that we will find our shalom. There are calls to a different set of instincts and I hope that we acknowledge we are in a period where the tectonic plates are shifting, where the church is in one of the deepest moments of crisis, not because some election result or not, but because of what has been exposed to be the poverty of the American church and its capacity to be able to see and love and serve and engage in ways in which you simply fail to do. And that vocation is the vocation that must be recovered and must be made real in tangible action. In closing, uh, let me circle back to, to where I began. Um, I've spent my entire life in politics, and I don't regret having done so for a moment. I understand politics uh, has downsides and dark sides, which is simply to say it's a human enterprise, like every other on Earth. But it matters, and it should matter to people of faith. The reason is that politics is, at the end of the day, when all is said and done about pursuing justice, even if imperfectly, and justice always matters. So my encouragement to others, and especially to the younger generation, is don't withdraw from politics, but do find a better way to engage with it. The political and cultural movement I have in mind will require Christians to make a compelling case for social order and moral excellence, but done with the generosity of spirit, all the while offering a healing touch. It will require Christians to be less fearful and more hopeful, less anxious and more confident that God is sovereign, and his purpose is ultimately don't rest on our efforts. Christians engaged in public life should model calm trust rather than panic and vitriol born of anxiety. We are called to be faithful, not successful. So keep a critical distance, be willing to speak truth to power, hold on to the timeless principles, seek the welfare of the city to which you've been called. Don't compromise your integrity in exchange for access to power and use the same ethical standards on people in your own party as you do for people in the other party. The words of Martin Luther King Jr. are instructive. The church must be reminded that it's not a master or servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. I'm grateful for those of you who, uh, because of your faithfulness and your love of our country, have acted as a conscience of the state. Thanks very much, and I look forward to, you, uh, to the conversation with you. questions, please uh, go on Slido and ask them, and I'll get it up here on my, on my phone. So the question I have for you, Pete, and thank you for those remarks. You ever feel like uh, the passage in Isaiah 40 about the voice of one crying out in the wilderness? And if so, or if you don't feel that, who are the other people who are speaking truth to power? Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Is this on? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I wouldn't say sort of a, a voice in the wilderness. Um, I'm relatively politically homeless on these, uh, these, these days. Um, and, uh, and it's a journey that's, that's not been the easiest um, because, um, because I was a product of the, of the Republican Party uh, for so many years. And obviously I worked in three administrations 
and cared very deeply for what I thought were the principles of, of, of the party. Um, but when, when I broke more or less with it during, during the Trump years, um, it probably wasn't as hard as maybe some people thought because I think just by how I grew up and what shaped me, I was less interested in parties than the ideals of parties and the ideas of parties. So I viewed them as a kind of instrument, an instrumentality to try and advance what I understood to be, to be justice and the, and, the, uh, and the common good. And so I think in some ways, um, once I felt like that wasn't happening, um, breaking away from it in the, in the, in the way that I did um, was, um, was easier than it might have been for some people. I'm still a conservative, um, and, um, and I'm still, still a Christian, um, but, uh, but some of those affiliations have, you know, have, 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 uh, uh, have been, um, have been frayed. Um, you know, it's, when I went into politics and then into writing, it was just a matter of sort of saying what I felt that I needed to say, what um, in good conscience I could say. I think what's helped me is, if you had asked me during pre-2016 to name the 20 or 25 people who um, I respected the most um, and who I felt like knew me best and loved me most, I think the majority, probably the vast majority, would have been disappointed if I'd have taken a stance other than what, what I have. And most of all, I would have been disappointed in myself. And that's, um, that's important uh, when you think about the people in your life that you look up to and, and the ones that are most, most formative. And it is true that there are people that um, have formed a kind of community for, for, for me. Uh, many of them are writers, but also people people of of, uh, of faith. Um, David Brooks is, is a good friend. I know David was here for the for the tribute for Mike. Mike, when he was alive, of course, was was a very close friend. Um, David French um, and and uh, a number of uh, a number of others. Um, other thing I'll say is about the the politics. Even though there have have been strange enough stayed in touch with people who have views different than mine, you know, from the Republican Party. And I've tried to maintain those relationships. And sometimes they've been strained, but I think for the most part, kind of worked, you know, worked, worked through it and, and understand, um, understand e e each, uh, uh, each other. Um, but as things kind of got shuffled around, um, I think it was kind of helpful that people that you once uh, viewed as a kind of cartoon image actually find out that there's more to them than you might have thought, and they find out that there's more to you than they may have they uh, they may have uh, that they may have thought. Thank you for that. Thank you for the questions that are coming in now. Here's a question for you, Pete. In a culture of TLDR, that's a new acronym for me, folks. It means too long, didn't read. How do you and your colleagues practically encourage people and our culture to think more deeply about a topic? Well, I think part of how you do it is you try and explain to people why thinking deeply about a topic actually matters, that there's a lot, ex that there's a lot at, uh, at stake. Um, and, uh, and the stakes, I require require that. I think another thing is that actually to explore topics, to wrestle with them, to learn more about them, um, can be an exciting adventure. Uh, it's I suppose it's part of the notion of being learners throughout uh, throughout um, throughout life. Um, and you know, s sometimes you 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 ride the surface waves of life, and that's okay. From time to time, we we all do it. We all need places of rest and refuge. Um, but there are also things that require really deeper thought. And I think people um, of faith, of the Christian faith, there's something I think incumbent upon us to uh, be able to tie a lot of these issues to deeper things. Um, 
and, and, um, and, and, and human life, human purpose, um, and how to be agents of, of reconciliation uh, and, uh, and agents of, of, uh, of truth. Um, and then you just, you know, you, you write in a way that you feel like can reach people. Mm -hmm. And different writers have different skills, and some are persuaders, and, and some are view themselves as, you know, as, um, as, as prophets. And I think um, writers and commentators and people who, who, who speak in the public square, uh, you know, they don't have to do everything. Um, I think different people are equipped with different skills based on different life circumstances. Right. Right. And so I think that uh, people just need to, to make the case as best they can. And then you hear back from people and find out this is what reached me or this, is, this is, doesn't, you know, doesn't reach me. And I think you always have to be open. This is not easy, but just open to refining your approach and listening to your critics and thinking, you know, what am I doing wrong? Or what can I do, do better? Um, as I said, it's not, it's not easy, but it's, sure. it's important to do. So how long have you been in Washington now? How many years? Gosh, I came, um, I came in uh, my senior year uh, from college. I actually did an internship and, um, at the Center for Strategic International Studies, which is a um, think tank mm -hmm. in, in D.C., and then I never left. So I was... Uh, I was in, in my early early 20s. So maybe and now 40. I'm 35 or so. Okay, so only 15 years then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you think that social media adds to the political divide? Maybe because people hide behind their anonymity? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, there's no question that that's, that's the case. Uh, you know, there's a debate on, on how much of a factor it is. I mentioned Jonathan Haidt. Um, and, and Jonathan has written pretty powerfully on this issue. He's actually got, got a book coming out, uh, I think, in a few, a few months uh, on, on this mm -hmm. matter. And um, he puts an enormous amount of responsibility on, on social media in several respects. One is a lot of the depression and struggling that young people um, are dealing with. If you look at the rates of suicide and depression and isolation, they're just skyrocketing, especially among teen girls. Um, and social media, in his estimation, is, is a huge driver of that. So there's that, there's that element. But there's no question that, you know, social media has made us angrier. And I do think that the anonymity is part of it, that people can say something online that I think they'd be more reluctant as a general matter to say to you uh, if to your face. Um, and certainly the ability to try and get pe to know people and people in their complexity, to try and understand why they hold the views that they do, what's their story that's led them. I mean, that's impossible to do with social media. And, and then there's the, the, the whole incentive structure is just off. Um, and that's true in a lot of aspects of life and in our politics. But you don't get a lot of clicks and followers in social media if you're pretty decent pretty kind, <laughs> pretty balanced in, in, in expressing your views. Yeah. The way you do it is by causing people to get outraged, to make extreme statements, and by generating emotions, intense emotions, positive and negative. And that gets people um, you know, into the public conversation, and a lot of folks like, uh, like that. So I think when people think through what can be done to heal our country. The social media part of it is, is a pretty big deal. It's unclear at this point what we do about it. Right. I think that we've made some progress over, over, over years, but this often happens, which is when there's an advent of something that, that is damaging, and, and I don't pretend that social media is across the board damaging. I mean, I'm on social media, I find a lot of interesting stuff on it, things to read and things to follow. But uh, there's also kind of heatedness that, that, that you, can, you can see. But when you have an, something new that puts people back on their heels, it takes some time to figure out how to deal with it. And I think we're trying to work our way through it. I'm not an expert in that area, but I, I would certainly be interested in talking to the people who are and figuring out what can be done to mitigate its consequences. Thank you. How would you describe Christian nationalism? How is it positively or negatively impacting our culture? 
Yeah, Christian nationalism, I think, is a, is a pretty broad term. Um, I think it's in more benign form. It's, it's in some respects probably a thought to be by some people who would consider themselves Christian nationalists to be patriots, people who love their, their country. Um, and that I don't have any, any, any problem with. I think the more um, malicious, extreme form of Christian nationalism are uh, people who, who believe not only that this country was formed um, by, uh, by Christian values and, and you know, people of the Christian faith, which, which is true, though it was never a Christian country per se, but think that that is what ought to define it, and those who are not Christian uh, should, um, uh, should have some disadvantages. And often what goes along with Christian nationalism and its more extreme version is a certain view of a, of a kind of culture, uh, honestly, a kind of white culture that's very, very um, hostile to immigrants, people of, uh, of, uh, of, of color. And, the, and then there's a group, they're called Catholic Integralists. And um, this is a group of people who believe that classical liberal democracy, pluralism, is inherently antithetical to a good social order. They think that they, basically the game is rigged and that liberal, classical liberal values, pluralism, inevitably leads to progressivism. And so they are really against liberal democracy as we've long understood and want to impose a kind of theocracy. Um, it says, you know, that, that the, uh, the, the government itself and, and the laws are going to be um, based on, on their view of, of theology. Um, that's not going to get anywhere um, because the country's just not in a position where it would accept that. But it is interesting that there is that sort of feeling that's going on. I, I think, you know, when I, when I ask the question, what's, what's behind that? Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's driving that feeling for, for people who hold, in this case, views different than mine and even views, in some cases, that I think are, are, are noxious? Um, I think a lot of it is fear, a sense of fear that, a, and not all of it is unwarranted by any means. There's a sense that there have been cultural convulsions, that the society has changed, the culture has changed, um, that uh, kids are vulnerable, that families are vulnerable. And, and so there's a lot of fear about the direction that the country is going in, and they want to reclaim it, and they want to fight, fight for it. So I understand that. that uh, that impulse, but the, how that manifests itself um, matters um, matters a lot. The other thing I'd say about Christian nationalism is, I'd be hard pressed to think of another f figure who is more against Christian nationalism than Jesus. Um, I, I mean, his ministry was actually against that nationalism. And what was so striking at the time, one of the things that was so striking and revolutionary, was that he broke down these barriers, these walls of, of nation, of race, of religion. And there was a universalism in, in, in his life and in his ministry. Um, so I, I just can't see how Jesus himself would be an advocate for, for that. And I think historically, it just it, it hasn't been a winning uh, winning in terms of converting people to the faith. Right. Are you aware of any other policy ideals that represent Christian ideas the way PEPFAR did? PEPFAR, this is recent American history, Presidential's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. That was a Bush uh, plan for uh, AIDS relief in Africa, and it saved millions of lives. Yeah. Yeah, uh, PEPFAR was one of, uh, it was, I think, the greatest achievement of the Bush presidency. Uh, and I think it was one of the great and humane programs in, in American history, quite honestly. And Mike Gerson, um, whom, you, whom you honored s some months ago here, thanks for, for doing that and doing it in such a lovely way. Um, you know, Mike was one of the drivers of that. Um, there were a number of angels in that, uh, in that effort. Mike was one, Josh Bolton, a fellow named Mark Dibel, who uh, worked at the National Institutes of Health. Tony Fauci was, was key. And President Bush, um, of course, as, as well. Um, and that's an, that's an interesting story because um, there was no clamoring for a global AIDS initiative at, that, at the time. There was really no constituency for it. 
But this was a need. I mean, millions of Africans were dying of AIDS. And um, it, that process that was in place to try and figure out what could be done to try and, and uh, solve this problem and, and heal those people was, was remarkable. It was, it was textbook. It was much more complicated at the time than I think people understand in retrospect. Uh, and there had been failures in public health efforts as well. So there was a lot of thought, a lot of accountability. Um, but once President Bush became convinced this was the right thing to do, um, he poured an enormous amount of money. I think it was $15 billion the first year, which was many times beyond what any amount of money had ever been spent. Yeah, that was B with a, that was billion, billion with a B, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. And, um, and the latest estimates are that uh, it's saved 25 million people, 25 million people who are alive today because of the PEPFAR um, initiatives. So it was, to me, one of the most unambiguously good things um, that government has, has done. And it's, I, I wouldn't argue that it wouldn't have been done or couldn't have been done by people who, were, who did not have faith. It certainly could have. And I know enough people who are non-Christians to know their decency and their, and, their, and their kindness and their care for humanity. But I will say in this particular case that there's no question in my mind that the faith of the key actors in the PEPFAR initiative um, was a kind of piston in the engine of that, uh, of that effort. And, um, and I wish, um, you know, more people uh, understood how good it was. I, I will say that at this moment, the House Republicans are threatening to cut the, the funding for, for PEPFAR and, and the reauthorization, which um, is a very difficult thing, I think, for, for those of us who were involved in this effort. And um, probably not a party that perceives itself as pro-life really wants to, mm -hmm. wants, to, wants to get on the wrong side of that. So you said 25 million, right? 25 million lives. Yeah. Folks, put that in perspective. That's roughly the size of somewhere between my, or, uh, Florida and Texas. Because I think Florida has a population of about 20 million, and I think Texas is about 25. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. Yeah. Here's another question. Hmm. Would, mainstream, would the mainstream media reward, i.e. give a platform to the ironic, thoughtful, humble, public Christian leader spokesman you described? Uh, Christian spokespeople? Correct. Uh, not as much. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that's a problem. I mean, conflict sells uh, in, in, yeah. in media and on television. Um, and we're talking about it in social media. Uh, and so people who make outrageous statements often get most of the attention. And that's the nature of, uh, of life in this world. It's not unusual. I mean, it's been the case some varying degrees, you know, Th through in politics and, and, and throughout much of our, our history. But I think what complicates it now is just the, the, the social media and, and, right. and, and the omnipresence of, of, um, of media. But you never know uh, either. Um, you know, in the life of a nation, like a life of an individual, there are, there are certain inflection points. And you, you don't know when certain things will happen. Right. Um, all you can do is, 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 is to be as faithful as you can. And if you speak the truth, but truth with some degree of, of, of compassion and thoughtfulness, um, that can catch on, particularly if I think if a country is exhausted, mm -hmm. if a country is just, or a majority of a country feels like we're just tired of the anger and the acrimony and the antipathy, and we're looking for something something uh, something else and there have been political leaders for sure who have who have uh, hit notes of hope and optimism I mean certainly Ronald Reagan in the Republican Party I mean if anything you know Reagan was maybe arguably slightly over optimistic but he was so hopeful and it was so deep in him it was so manifest his whole kind of city you know city on a hill and for liberals, when Barack Obama ran in 2008, I mean, I know that conservatives would say that 
that uh, that that the words and the actions were 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 incongruent. But you know, his his campaign of hope uh, certainly reached millions and millions of. Uh, of people, um, so I, I think it can it can happen, but it has to be authentic right. to to the political right. figure. It has to speak to the moment. Uh, you can't uh, like you know if Republicans just use the rhetoric of Ronald Reagan today, it just wouldn't work because the circumstances are different, the mood of the country is different. So you have to try and figure out what does it mean to be hopeful and optimistic right. and encouraging in in a particular uh, in a particular. Um, uh, uh, context. And then the last thing I'll say is in terms of, of figures who are ironic, Christian figures. Um, I mean, he wasn't a huge media star, but Tim Keller was a hugely influential mm -hmm. figure uh, in the wider society. And, and Tim was a good friend of mine, uh, and he, he died several months ago from, from pancreatic cancer. Um, the outpouring of uh, love and affection and respect for uh, for Tim was enormous. He had tremendous reach, and not just in the in the Christian world. I um, introduced him to to a f good friend of mine, a journalist, Jonathan Rausch. Mm -hmm. Jonathan is uh, Jewish, gay, and atheist, and we were part of a weekly Zoom conversation on uh, Thursdays, uh, which John hosts, and I'm sort of a co-host along with another guy as a pastor. As we call it pastors and friends. And, um, you know, we just meet for an hour. It was a very organic conversation. And uh, there's a, but it really works. And there's a kind of ethos and that, that, that exists. And John got to know um, Tim uh, through, these, through these conversations. And when um, Tim died, uh, John wrote a piece in the Religious News Service in tribute uh, to Tim, and John said that he loved him. He had come to love him, and uh, and I think that uh, uh, that Tim loved loved John, and so this was an unlikely friendship, yeah. um, but it was a beautiful friendship, and it showed the capacity of people of integrity with faith, being able to mm -hmm. make unlikely friends, and have unlikely re relationships that can really uh, glorify God. So we only have time for a couple more questions, so I will read the top two vote-getters here. Number one, how do you lead by example in making friends across party lines, not just with Republicans, but also Democrats or people of other progressive political influence? Yeah, I mean, you know, the way you do it is you, is, is, is you do it. I mean, in, to some extent, it needs to be natural. Um, I don't think right. you necessarily kind of go out and search, you know, you know of, of people and say, "I want to, I want to be your, uh, I want to be your friend." But it depends, you know, of your station in life. Some of it may be within a person's neighborhood. Some of it could be, um, you know, professional. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways that it that it can uh, that it can happen. Um, but the chances are that given the orbits in which all of us live in, or the different orbits in which we live in, there are going to be people who hold political views, ideological views, that are different in yours. Um, and then I think it's a matter of being alert to, to those people and to, to getting into creating relationship with them in a way that's, that seems natural. And then I think once, once you, you do that, What's important is um, is to listen to their stories and hopefully to have them listen to your your stories. Uh, David Blankenhorn runs a runs a terrific group called Pray for Angels, and it models how to have conversations with uh, red and blue Americans. And the purpose is not to get one group to change the mind of the other. The purpose is to do exactly what the question or said, which is how do you model the engagement with, with each other? And David said that, you know, one of the best opening questions to have in, in conversations with people who hold views different than you um, is not to, you know, explain or def defend your views. It's tell me about how you came to believe what you believe and let people begin to tell their story for one thing, it it's just diffuses the situation. 
But it also helps you understand that different life experiences uh, create different, different uh, um, views and, and, and values and different interpretations. Um, Excuse me, what, what is this organization called again? It's called Braver Angels. Braver Angels, Angels. one word, is, is that a dot .org? Or? Yeah, if, I mean, if you Google Braver okay. Angels or go braverangels.org, uh, and they, they really do, do terrific work. There are chapters all around the okay. country. They just had a gathering about a month or two ago in uh, Gettysburg, and um, one of the, the sessions had Francis Collins, who was formerly director of National Institutes of Health, uh, and, um, uh, and I love Francis, so I'm not, I'm not objective when I speak about, about him. Um, and they had a guy named, who had become a friend of Francis's, Wilk Wilkinson, who was, I think, a truck driver. But they had become friends through Braver Angels, had conversations, and then they had a, they had a discussion. And they were both better for having the discussion because Francis was able to hear from, from Wilk what the experience was like for COVID for people in his community uh, and what was happening with some of the various shutdowns and other things and um, how he heard what was coming through. And Wilk was able to hear from Francis what they were facing at the time, some of the extraordinary successes. So that kind of thing can, um, can happen. Another thing, it's a great exercise to, to, to do. There's a group, it's the, I think it's called the Long Foundation in San Francisco. And one of the rules of a debate, if they have a liberal and conservative debate, is the first thing that you have to do is when you get up to make a point is you have to articulate the view of the person you're debating and you have to express it in a way that that person says, yeah, that's a fair presentation of what I believe. And then the other person has to do it too. And if you ever do that exercise with people, you begin to see how kind of the apertures begin to, to open up, just giving voice to uh, what you think is a fair-minded representation of somebody that you disagree with and to verbalize, you know, to verbalize it, um, you begin to learn things. Final question, and I think part of your answer is braver angels, but let me read this anyway. Mm -hmm. In a world of misinformation and sensationalistic reporting, what do you, Pete Weiner, read and listen for good, helpful information on current events? Well, uh, yeah, I try and read different newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post. So those are, those are the, the, uh, the main ones. Um, then I follow different people on social media, some people that I agree with for sure, some people that I, that I um, disagree with. Um, for example? Uh, oh gosh, it's political figures on kind of left and, left and, uh, and right. Um, trying to think of who, who the people would be, some, some, some people on Fox News, some people on MSNBC, OA, AOC, Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, just a lot of different. Now, those are, those are kind of the extremes, and then you get more, you know, more of people are sort of center left and center, center, uh, center right. Um, and, um, but part of it is just a kind of discipline, I think, which is to try and explore. So if I'm writing an essay um, on a particular topic, I try and research not just people who agree with what I say, but, but what people who disagree with, with me say. If nothing else, it helps equip me to try and present a point of view with some degree of subtlety and to anticipate what the responses you know, might um, might uh, might be, um, and then there are there are essayists and columnists, and you know there's everyone from the Federalist and National Review, uh, and the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, more on 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 the right, to New York Magazine and Slate and and uh, and so forth, and then I write for the Atlantic, which has conservatives and liberals, but it's sort of center center left. Uh, and then, and then the the uh, the New York Times. Um, so that's 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 what uh, what 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 I read. And then, to some extent, I think we all, uh, if we're, if we're um, trying to learn um, some issue, most of us defer to authority figures, right? Uh, if, if you're talking about science or theology, there are certain people that you're drawn to. And I think we all we all do that. I'm a fan of you know N.T. Wright. 
a theologian, um, and he knows a lot more about theology than than I do. Um, but um, but I'll I'll listen to him carefully. And one other thing I'll say about uh, just theology is I think bears on this on this question. One of the gifts I've I've benefited from is having friends um, who are pastors and theologians throughout my life. And so a lot of times I will ask, and Tim was among these people, when I have questions about theology, because I've always been a question asker in, in my faith that hasn't really come all that naturally to, to me. And I'll write people and I'll probe them on questions. You know, I just was in a discussion with a, with a pastor and a theologian and one other person on reformed theology and original sin, mm. where I went through and just sort of asked these questions. And so I find that really helpful um, to be able to find people you trust, you feel like they know more than you do, and you may not agree with them or you may agree with them, but to be able to find people where you can sort of ask these questions and say, how do you think about this? Show me where you think I'm wrong in my reasoning or what, sh what should I see? Um, and that goes back to the point I made about the sort of Lewis Barfield um, example. I mean, I don't do this nearly well enough, and I have my own blind spots for, sh for sure. But I do think that that notion of debating not for victory, but debating for truth is a really big deal. And it's an entirely different approach. Because if you debate for truth, it means that you actually, on some level, appreciate people who can refine and, and correct your position. Because in the end, we're not, we're not here to defend some propositions, right. whether they're true or not. We're here to try and, and represent what we believe to be truth, which ultimately, for those of us, the Christian faith is, is, is found in the person of, uh, of, um, of Christ. So if you can find people in your life who, who are able to nudge you in that direction, you know, it's a huge gift. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Pete Wainer. And, and since Pete is from Washington, D.C., he knows all about the challenge coin, as do my ISP students. So let me present you with a challenge coin. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for your time. <laughs>